There we go. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the 10th annual Tantramar Climate Change Week, which is funded by the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund. My name is Kirsty, and I'm the Climate Change Coordinator for the Town of Sackville with EOS Eco Energy. EOS is an environmental charity that has more than 17 years of experience working on community-based projects related to energy conservation, efficiency, renewable energy, sustainable community planning, climate change adaptation, and watershed health. EOS would like to respectfully acknowledge that our work is done on the traditional unceded lands and waters of the Mi'kmaq. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and say where you are tuning in from today as well. Just a few notes before we get started. I'm sure everyone is very aware by now, but please keep yourself on mute just so we don't have any noise distractions. If you have any questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat so you don't forget them and we will do our best to get to them at the end during our question and answer period. And as you would have just heard, this webinar is, will also be recorded and then uploaded onto EOS's YouTube channel afterwards for other people to watch later on. I will also be sending an evaluation survey in the chat near the end. We would really appreciate it if you could fill it out. It should only take a few minutes. So with that, I would love to introduce our speaker from today. So we have Cedric McLeod joining us here. Cedric grew up in Carleton County, New Brunswick, working in the family concrete construction business and developed an early love for agriculture with encouragement from dad and many construction jobs being in the agricultural field. A desire to tackle soil health and conservation challenges in the New Brunswick potato belt led Cedric towards the completion of a Bachelor of Science from the Nova Scotia Agricultural College and a master's degree from the University of Manitoba Department of Soil Science. His early career experience immersed Cedric in the agricultural greenhouse gas management field where he has led or contributed to the development of numerous Canadian and international greenhouse gas quantification protocols in the livestock and cropping sectors. Most recently, Cedric, through his work with the Canadian Forage and Grassland Association, has supported the development of the very first grassland greenhouse gas quantification protocol approved by the, for the Canadian forage sector. Cedric operates a grass-fed beef. Oops, I'm joining people here, sorry. My screen just went away. Cedric operates a grass-fed beef and annual crop production operation in Centerville, New Brunswick with his wife, Alonda, and son, Kaylin. So with that, I would love to turn it over to you, Cedric. Lovely, thanks, Kirsty. Doing a time check here, it's five after. Yeah. Um, yeah, I encourage folks, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and pop the chat function open here and keep it, uh, keep it live. The presentation I'm gonna give you today was something I originally uh, did up for the Newfoundland Young Farmers and was delivered last fall around environmental leadership. So I can go on probably feel close to an hour with, with discussion. So if you do have things you'd like to pop in, I can stop and we can have a quick chat if, if that's okay, Kirsty, just so we're not filling a full hour with, with presentation. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, glad to be here. Um, followed the, the EOS Eco Energy stuff. Uh, work for, for years with interest. I've been in the greenhouse gas game for almost two decades now. I was definitely there before. It was cool. Um, and now, you know, we've we evolved from a position where we had an opportunity to teach and, and let the industry evolve over time to a position where we really haven't moved very quickly and we're up against some significant challenges um, as the front line uh, in, in, in the climate change challenges that are coming. So I'll take you through what I know, um, what, I, what I've learned, what I think I know, um, and uh, look forward to some questions afterwards. So you've seen this before, sustainability focus across the value chain. And I'm going to focus a lot today in my presentation on, on the value chain 
because I think what we've come to understand is that, you know, to deal with the climate change challenge, you know, no longer can we say, well, the oil and gas sector is so big, they should do it. The transportation sector is another massive chunk, they should do it. It really is going to take a concerted effort on everybody's behalf to do a little part. Everybody's got to do a little part and another little part and another little part and, and adopt a mindset of continuous improvement. And that's one thing that I've really worked on with my clients, come to understand that over the last couple of years. Evolution in the way we do things is a lot more effective than change. People definitely fear change to start, stop, right, wrong, right? Evolving our processes and adopting that continuous improvement model is something that you know I'm trying to deploy on my farm and encourage my, my clients to use as well so that they're not you know hit you know hitting hitting any brick walls when it comes to sustainable right we're really looking towards resilience right that's really what we're what we're trying to tackle in our in our agricultural production systems these days to deal with lots of water no water in the same season out of season like we've seen it in new brunswick over the last five years two drought years and five you know when i all all through my my early years you know, you could count on an inch of rainfall a week. Well, now you can't. We've got to build systems that are resilient. So, you know, deal with the planet, with the people, having the right people on the farm, dealing with labor, right? Labor challenges are major issues. And then the profit side, we've been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And so I'll save that conversation for, I was going to get into it, but I don't want to, I don't want to ruin my next couple of slides. So a little bit about goals. And Whose goals are you targeting when we talk about resilience, when we talk about sustainability? Are we talking about our own goals on the farm as primary producers? Are we talking about value chain players? New entrants to the, to, to the game, very important. Um, our provincial governments, obviously we've got our, our, provincial, our provincial targets for uh, largely around food security and sustainability. And then you've got the government of Canada that's made some very significant commitments internationally for the way that we do things uh, that are going to impact our farmers and ranchers. So again, whose goals are you targeting? If you're on the farm, <clears throat> we're looking for annual crop productivity. We're seeing this year a major spike in, in, in fertilizer prices. So you know, bringing in nutrients from outside of the region is getting difficult. Why? China has made some major moves along trade routes to, to limit exports of manufactured product. Well, guess what, right? Nitrogen, nitrogen prices are through the roof. So not that we don't have options, but those kind of, again, evolution versus change, evolution allows us to get prepared for the change um, or, or to, the, to the evolving circumstance, change doesn't. Again, I mentioned that variable drought, saturated soil conditions, right? Like we got 11 inches of rain here in the potato belt. Uh, during harvest last year, uh, the year before we had the most significant drought we'd seen in, in 54 years, 57 years, right? So last year we struggled with, with yield. This year we struggled with quality as, they, as those spuds went into storage. They're breaking down because of waterlog and, and, and rot, right? So we've got, we've got to be able to build systems that are resilient to, to those extremes. The long-term crop productivity of our soils is, is a major, has to be a major focus. And we really do have young soils compared to the prairies. When we think about how our soils were formed under uh, coniferous forest, right? Versus those in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, uh, down through the Great Plains of the US formed under grasslands, right? Millennia, millennia of grass, of grass, buffalo grazing, right? So our soils are young. And so they're not necessarily ready and able to absorb a lot of organic matter. And yet we know it's the organic matter that drives resilience. So that's a challenge. And a goal. Profitable, obviously it's gotta be, if we're not, uh, if we're running red ink year over year over year based on the systems that we're running, that's, that's certainly not sustainable. And then thinking about, you know, our goals in the short and long term. And so I've been in a greenhouse gas game like say for almost two decades, but largely focused on mitigation. And I'm here to tell you that mitigation now in my world is taking a second fiddle to adaptation. 
I don't think we've acted fast enough. I think the changes are going to come. And I think our opportunity now is to get ready for it. So that's where adaptation, that long-term focus has become more important for my own personal sustainability. So now let's talk about the value chain, right? The global food chain suppliers are committing, you know, through the science-based targets initiative, for example, right? The PepsiCo's, the Unilever's, the Danone's, the McCain's, the Cavendish's, making global commitments to reducing their emissions. And that's okay until you take a look at the fact that 70 to 85% of greenhouse gas emissions associated with our food on the plate comes from behind the farm gate. So when, our, when, when the food value chain players way up the chain, the processors and retailers are making the claims, they're not making it for themselves. They're making it on behalf of the growers. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, who pays for that? Who pays for that? And that's okay if Max wants to stand up, you know, on behalf of McCain Foods and say, this is our commitment to global sustainability. As long as we're bringing the checkbook back and saying, all right, farmer A, B, C, D, and X, here's some dollars to help you to evolve your system to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Because up until very recently, it really hasn't been that big of a focus. So to me, the challenge here with, with these value chain sustainability goals is who carries the weight of the change. So provincial goals, again, number three on whose goals are we trying to achieve? You know, in terms of greenhouse gas and climate change impact, obviously the Maritimes, you know, carry, you know, small agriculture in Canada only carries eight to nine percent of, of the load. And then, you know, we're one percent of, of that food, of that food shift in Canada. So not going to make a huge impact on the commitment to, you know, Paris said to 2030. However, our sustainability goals are more focused on resilience of our localized food systems and minimizing the risk of relying on food imported from elsewhere. I think that's really more the sustainability focus for our provincial governments. And, and we've seen it, you know, through, our, through, through the COVID era, um, food self-sufficiency has become a very hot topic of conversation. And the last one I put there is that risk of fertilizer imports, right? And if you think about it, you know, we grow a lot of product here. We use fertilizer to grow that product. We use manures to grow that product. We have legumes in the system to help us grow that product. But then we don't, once it goes through the human population, it goes through an entirely different system. And that system is meant for disposal. It's not meant for recycle, right? So we need to be thinking very carefully about how are the nutrients that come in through our food and through our communities, how those nutrients get brought back. Because we're not gonna be able to mine phosphorus out of Florida and Morocco forever. And we know that phosphorus is absolutely critical to food production, right? And we've got lots of it, you know where it is. We've got to figure out how to get it back on the land safely. Government of Canada. Their goals, 30% use of nitrogen fertilizer over the coming decade, right? We know why they're doing that. Nitrous oxide is the, is the most rapid growth greenhouse gas emissions in the Canadian ag sector. Why? Because our crop genetics allow us to grow 200 bushel, 225, 250 bushel corn in Southern Ontario. We're going 70, 80 bushel corn in Western Canada. That takes nitrogen to drive those protein synthesis systems. Can we do better? I think so. David Burton, you know, was on my thesis advisory committee, gave a presentation this morning, New Brunswick Soil and Crop, talked about we were only at 50% nutrient use efficiency in, in nitrogen. Not acceptable. Certainly not acceptable. We can do better and we must do better. Increasing our soil carbon sequestration. Again, looking out to Paris 2030, right? They want emissions reductions, real emissions reductions, whether it be through carbon sequestration or reduced nitrous oxide or methane capture off the manure storage, they're looking for those reductions. And so now as a global or a national or provincial agriculture community, we've got to come together and figure out how to get this. So again, nitrogen management, critical. Legumes, critical. We can do it. We know how to do it. 
it's a change in mindsets that, that's holding us back. Okay. No questions in the chat. Those are the goals. So I'm going to speak uh, a little bit to, to regenerative agriculture. And, you know, I've really been a regen guy since the start of my career, right? I was looking at that soil health, I was looking at soil conservation, you know, changed my, my major in undergrad and ended a master's in soils because I was so passionate about, this, about the, soil, the soil system and, and, and preserving, you know, its function for the next generation. And so when Regen came, I was kind of like, really? Like, is this, this is, is this new? Like, this is the stuff we've talked about for a long time. And that's okay, but it's been rebranded, right? So, so I, I went back and I, and I took a look at, you know, some of the core principles that folks like Gabe Brown and others have, have advanced, you know, and really appreciate the work Gabe has done on his farm, built a, built a beautiful model there. Do I think it's going to work for everybody? No. Do I think the principles stick? Absolutely. So this is my region. And I've actually got eight um, that, I, that I want to take you through, not four, because I'm trying to take an expanded view of how, again, we can change our production systems incrementally and not just look at start, stop, right, wrong, do this, do that, but focus more on, on evolution. So you notice here I'm starting at two, which means there's another one. And here it is. Do not let excellence be the enemy of good. Right? Do not let excellence be the enemy of good. If we can advance some of these projects, and it has to be continuous, eating this elephant a bite at a time, to me, that's a, that's a path forward that will get us over the goal line as opposed to a complete reformation of the entire system, because that typically in my world hasn't been super successful. So that's where that continuous improvement is number one principle in advancing regen agriculture as far as I'm concerned. So let's talk about emissions a little bit before we go too far. So this is your typical greenhouse gas emissions profile of the farm, right? So you got, this is a, this is obviously, it's a pig barn. And my first job out of, out of grad school was working for the Canadian Pork Council. We were teaching farmers how to manage greenhouse gas. So this is where the schematic came from. I was always very proud of it. Now it looks fairly simple, but back in 17 years ago at a PowerPoint, it wasn't too, too bad. So we've got, you know, methane coming out uh, from the manure system or from dairy. You know, we've got some dairy cows in there. We've got enteric fermentation coming over. We got a manure storage there. So we've got some fermentation happening there. So we're getting methane. What's the opportunity? Uh, and then we're moving that manure out to, out to the field level. And we're seeing some nitrous oxide emissions come out of that manure nitrogen, again, that nitrogen component through those biological processes. And we've also got the carbon dioxide that are coming from the use of fossil energies to move those products, uh, either feed into the barn and then manure back out to the field um, or, or what have you. Transportation emissions are definitely a part. It's a small part, but it's a part. So same thing with the dairy cows. Here you go, I've got my little animations going there. So same thing with the cropping sector, you know, different set of emissions, but um, the, largely the same gases. So we're looking at, we're running our cropping systems, we're doing some tillage, we see the CO2 coming out from tillage, and we're over into fertilizer management as nitrogen comes in, whether or not it's organic in the form of manure or compost uh, or, you know, synthetic mineral, uh, synthetic fertilizer products, right? We're going to see that nitrous oxide come out. Can we offset that with some legumes? Absolutely. And I love that idea for those of you that are thinking about it. Then as we move across, we got crop storage and crop processing. Again, using energy to further process, uh, to process those crops. So two different profiles, no methane on this one, more nitrous oxide uh, potentially uh, playing a role, especially in the Atlantic region where we have a lot of potato production, um, very poor, nutrient use efficiency just because of the, the, the nature of, of the root systems that they carry, but they're also, you know, heavy nitrogen feeders. So um, guaranteed had, you know, a two and a half hour conversation this morning about how we're going to try and tackle that pork sector. So we do have options coming. So principle number two, right? 
Principle num number one, don't let excellence be the enemy of good. Those are your emissions that we got to deal with. We got to minimize our tillage. Got to minimize our tillage. The sun, you know, drives its interaction with plants and drives carbon into the soil. We've got those root exudates that are in there feeding the, 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 the rhizome. Um, all those bugs that exist in there and all those, all those interactions, when we touch it with steel, we wreck that house, right? So the way I look at the soil system, it, it is a house in which my microbes and, and, and arthropods and all the rest of them live. That whole biological community live there. When I touch it with steel, I break down that house. I don't want to break down the house. I want to let that carbon exist and let those bugs do their thing. Number three, certainly keep your soils covered. And this goes along. If you do need to touch the soil with steel and turn it over, make sure you get something coming back on over top. Um, soil erosion was what really drove my, my passion, my desire to enter the soil science arena. And so, yeah, soil erosion was, was the ticket and cover crops are, you know, hands down one of the best ways to do that if you're running annuals. The very best way to do it is never to turn it over and keep it in perennial cover, which means we're looking at things like uh, perennial forage. Uh, but not everybody can run that because not everybody has dairy or beef cows to feed them to. So we want to keep those soils covered. Minimize erosion, capture nitrogen or capture carbon all the way through the growing season and sequester residual fall nitrogen. So if you're looking at options for annual crops to try and deal with excess nitrogen in the fall, cover crops are a great way to do that because they're going to sequester that nitrogen and hold it in an organic form, basically lock it up in the bank account for the winter. And then when those soils liven back up again, start to break that organic matter down, um, that nitrogen will be released. So cover crops play a really important role in bridging both carbon and nitrogen cycles uh, throughout the winter and spring months. So there's that same one, keeping the soils covered, keep those roots in the system. Um, you know, lots of options there to introduce cover crops um, without a lot of work. And one thing about cover crops that, that keeps them on the periphery, especially in this part of the country, is to say, well, Cedric, look, we've got a really short growing season. I haven't got time to plant another crop after the first crop is off. And my response to that is, you're absolutely right. So don't worry about planting afterwards. Plant it in crop interseeding, intercropping. We can do those things quite effectively with a broadcast application of an Italian ryegrass under silage corn or red clover into winter wheat in the spring. Lots of different options uh, to keep those soils covered year round and they're not that expensive. And the long-term benefit of that accrues. We need to be taking, again, a long-term view of this and getting those incremental improvements year over year over year over year over year. Don't expect to see any big changes all in one year because it typically doesn't happen. Principle five, biodiverse cropping systems, right? We hear this again, uh, a lot in the regen ag networks, right? Lots of different root systems, C3, C4s, broadleaves, grasses, legumes, non-legumes, and I agree. I got about a nine way mix that I advocate for use in potato rotation. Costs about 35 bucks an acre. A lot of the common products that we would use anyway, right? It doesn't have to be super complex, doesn't have to be super expensive, but the diversity is really what we're after. And so I've given, you know, uh, lots of options here. I really should number them so I can take you through them. But, you know, the potato barley, unfortunately, is a rotation that still exists here in the potato belt obviously really lacking in diversity. That's where, you know, I developed a nine-way service crop to say, listen, if you're not gonna grow an active rotation crop, then at least grow something with some diversity itself and then go back to potatoes. Use that non-potato year as a way to invest in your soil, invest in the microbes, and they'll come back to you and do good work for you back in that potato year. But if we're growing a rotation crop, just the sake of growing a rotation crop, it's probably not a winner long-term. You see, as you get down through the system, right, we got some uh, C4s and C3s and a potato corn wheat rotation. You put some ryegrass underneath the wheat. Now you got four crops in three years. Um, if you get all the way to the bottom, 
you know, we got um, perennial forage, fall rye, corn silos, cob meal, and then perennial forage again. That's your alfalfa rotation, right? Just a whole big old mess of crops and lots of diversity and lots of perennials and annuals all mixed together. And I love those two bottom rotations because guess what they've got in them? They got dairy manure coming out or beef manure, right? To really stimulate microbial function. Integrated livestock, as I said, you know, and I had a chat with Dr. Cam Wag just this afternoon about the importance of supercharging um, microbial processes in our soil. Those have been devoid of livestock uh, manures for a lot of years. You know, the, the microbiological diversity is low, right? And, and the, it just doesn't come back overnight, right? So when we integrate the livestock, we bring that gut bacteria out through the manure and, and back into the soil system and, and it churns. There's a reason why the prairies, those tall grass prairies developed up deep black soils. It wasn't just because there was grass growing. Grass growing would have smothered itself out. It developed because the bison roamed it and chewed it up, not just with their face, but with their feet and they ground it in and they, and, and, and they defecated as they went. The system has evolved um, to, to give them the soils that they have and we don't. How do we get there? We gotta get some livestock back in the system. Responsible use of fertilizer inputs goes without saying. We're only at 50% nutrient use efficiency. It's not good enough. Um, we gotta get there. We've got some options. For our nutrient management, I guess is it would be the principal mechanism for driving nutrient use efficiency. Um, if you're currently, you know, primarily using nitrogen fertilizers uh, to, to feed your crops. If you're in that <clears throat> livestock game, you know, you've got all kinds of opportunities to generate biological source nitrogen through alfalfa uh, and other legumes on the farm and then utilizing your manure as effectively as possible. Can't get through a soil fertility conversation without talking about pH correction. Absolutely fundamental. If we're going to drive soil health and drive nutrient cycling efficiency, we've got to get our pHs up. We double microbial activity when we go from pH 5 to pH 6. And optimum levels is pH 6.5 for nutrient cycling, right? So we've got to make lime a fundamental component of our resiliency strategy. Because I guarantee you last year where we saw the poorest yields during that drought condition were the soils that were below pH 5.0. They're just not resilient. The bugs are trying to live in a very sour environment that really does not suit their growth habits. So they're not cycling the nutrients effectively and we're not getting maximum crop productivity. So soil pH is absolutely fundamental to soil. And the same thing about responsible use of, of crop protections. You know, um, I mean, it goes without saying, right? A lot of these products are, you know, fungicides, insecticides, you know, neurotoxins. Again, do we need to use some of these products in, in, in modern agriculture from time to time for pest infest, infestations? Yeah, we do. Can we build more resilient cropping systems that, that head that off? You bet we can. Uh, is that the challenge before us? Yes, it is. Okay, so your science step. Science step. Like, all right, yeah, that's 25 minutes. What about it? How about a top 10 list? Things we can do. Who's in? Hands up? No, no thumbs? Yeah, Kirsten's in. Okay, good. All right. So I've broken this down by emission source, right? So on the soil side, to tackle the carbon dioxide issue, right? And remember that diagram where we got carbon dioxide, fossil energies to drive our tractors and then CO2 emitted from the soil when we put steel uh, through, the, through the microbes house and break down that carbon. So get down to no-till, right? Let's stop tilling. And maybe it's not stopping the tillage in every year, but say, you know, say we're a, a corn, soybean, wheat, potato operator. Can I get away with tillage 
just to grow my spud crop and then go, you know, to a no-till program for the other three years? You bet you can't. Do we typically do that? No, because we're simplifying things. Even conservation tillage, right? If it's not, it doesn't have to be clean till every time. We got to minimize our imp, minimize our contact between tillage, steel, and the soil, the soil house in which our bacteria live. Number two on CO2, cover cropping, right? We're gonna keep those soils covered. We're gonna keep that carbon from going away, right? Keeping in mind that the finest particles, which is where you know, a lot of our cation exchange capacity lives is the first stuff to go, right? The, the, the clays and the silts are the first ones to go and they're taking carbon and fertility with them. So we keep the soils covered, keep the soils where they're supposed to be on the landscape so we can use them next year and they'll be there for the next generation to grow crops. Living roots year round to capture that sunlight, right? There's a reason why perennials do so well in carbon sequestration and, and, and nutrient cycling as a whole is because you've got those active roots that are there from early in the spring to late in the fall. Every single ray of sunshine that they can capture, they're grabbing, because there's no period where that soil is open and bare and nothing is growing in it. And as long as something is growing, the roots are pushing out those exudates and they're having those relationships with the neighbors. Keep in mind, this is microscopic now, right? We've got these little filaments all coming off our roots and the bacteria are making their homes around it in all these communities, but they're sharing the sunlight through exudates, sugars, right? Coming through that plant. So keeping them there, as long as possible is gonna to help to take that sunlight and turn it into carbon in the soil. Can't get away, I'm a forage guy, you know, grass-fed beef, so forages, you know, are, are my passion when I'm out <clears throat> and I've got my farmer hat on. Perennial forage systems really are the cat's pajamas for this, right? Because again, they've got, they're gonna cycle throughout the year, they've got cover all year round, right? Now you come in, you're grazing, you're cutting, you're getting those big flushes above ground of forage and then you cut it off. And the root systems were deep and now they're short and they, they prune off those roots and they're just, it's, it's just a factory for building soil carbon. So wherever we can get a perennial in rotation, even if it's for short duration, I don't care if it's a potato, you know, one year alfalfa crop and you take four cuts of alfalfa, at least you've got a perennial there getting that job done because you just don't get any better. It's world-class for CO2 collection in our soils. The second one is energy. So again, it's a small part, we're only about 10% of agricultural emissions in, in New Brunswick, but hey, that's okay. It's still an opportunity. So we look at energy efficiency first, right? Heating systems, building the most energy efficient building envelope that you can get off the hop, right? And it's never as cheap to do it than when you're doing it right up front, right? I'll come back and upgrade my insulation package. I'll come up and insulate my with and, and update my windows. Right? Use the programs that are out there. Get those envelopes built the way you need to right off the hop. Electrical systems, okay, that, that's control and technology. And, and you know, we're looking at things like uh, root crop vegetable storages, right? Putting variable frequency drives. On your, on your potato or carrot or onion storage so that you're monitoring CO2 and you're monitoring temperature. And that VFD is turning that fan up and turning it down to manage and maintain the optimum CO2 levels. It's a simple piece of technology, but it's, you know, and it's like payback in three to four years. But you'd be surprised how many new buildings are not using this technology because it's a few extra bucks up front. This is not the place to save money when you're building a commercial building in your energy system. On-farm renewable energy is the other option, right? Just offset it. So your electrical systems, wind, solar, biomass, biogas, if you're running a manure system, right? Ca capturing that methane, We've seen a lot of that happen in Ontario, We've seen a resurgence of the technology in Quebec. We've seen there's thousands of digesters in Germany that traveled over there in 2000. 2006 and did a tour. What a bunch of technology they had going on, but they had good renewable energy policy that really drove that. Then of course, there's always the thermal energy, you know, solar, uh, but I like the biomass on this side. 
And we just sold our house in, in Mactuac and, and we're building a new home. We're actually going to run geothermal in that one. So I'm pretty excited about that. But we, we ran pellets, um, heated our house as a primary heat source. It was wonderful. Love the ambiance. And what a way to support you know, a local biomass energy system, energy industry. We've got lots of that around. So um, moving into BMP number five. Remember, this is a top 10 list. We're kind of getting close there. Um, and we're moving into livestock and renewable. So now we're into methane emissions. Um, and we know from COP26 that methane is going to become a, a much bigger part of the picture moving forward. I think initially, you know, the, the, the spotlight was shone on the fossil energy sector. Um, you know, there's lots of methane pulled from natural gas wells, methane mines. But over the, over the following weeks, agriculture started to get a much closer look at methane. And so I think we need to prepare ourselves for, for what's coming down, down the policy pipe. And, and I think we've got some options to deal. So if we're talking about feeding systems, again, this is what's coming back out of the cow during, uh, during rumination, right? Enteric fermentation, back out, of, back out of the rumen. How do we deal with that? Well, we balance our rations, right? Feed additives, look at some feed additives like the seaweed story, you know, kind of a success story coming out of PEI. Or we've got some feeding trials that are coming out uh, that are starting on that right away. We're very excited about that technology and opportunity to minimize enteric fermentation emissions. But then we've also got just good fundamental agronomy in the forage production system, right? Maintaining 50% legume content. You know, the, you know, the beauty of keeping 50% legume content, not only does it reduce methane emissions from our cows, but it also means that we don't need to put any nitrogen fertilizer out on our foragers. Completely self-reliant through biological nitrogen fixation, right? Win, 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 it's across the board. And then, you know, high performance pasture management. We're gonna see a lot more focus on pastures. We've got the On-Farm Climate Action Fund that's been announced by Minister Bebo, 200 million bucks for the Canadian ag sector to adopt climate smart BMPs. Um, we're gonna see about 6 million bucks. 6 million of those bucks flow into New Brunswick alone over the next two years, right? Nitrogen management, cover cropping and pasture management. Really, really excited about driving some increased productivity on our pastures across, across the maritime zones. We know storage management, I mean, emptying management, that's, you know, that, that's an option, but what we really get down to it is, is storage coverage. Right, capturing the methane that's coming off of those manure storages and you know, turning them into either thermal and or electrical energy. I think that's our opportunity. We look at bringing in off farm sources of waste, waste product, you know, whether or not it be food processing waste or even just source separated organics from our cities and towns, right? All those nutrients are going away. They're going to the landfill. They're coming out as leachate at the bottom of those landfills. It's not an effective way to get those nutrients back. But if we can put them through biogas reactors, then it's. All right, last couple of slides uh, into soils, nitrous oxide. It goes without saying, we're using fertilizer and nitrogen. We're looking at the four hours, right? You're looking at using the right product, the right rate, the right time, the right place. Very, very strategic um, nutrient management planning. I've always loved the four R's. When I work with clients on nutrient management planning, I always love to get into the small details because that's where the biggest impacts are made. And we're gonna be advancing that further. And we do need to get better and we can get better um, with, with some fine tuning. We can meet the government of Canada's uh, commitments to reducing nitrogen fertilizer use by 30%. Cover cropping coming up again now on nitrous oxide, right? And I mentioned that earlier. It's not just keeping the soils covered. It's not just the carbon. It's those roots being active and reaching out and grabbing some of that fertilizer nitrogen that's left stranded at the end of the crop year. And, and keep in mind, this isn't, this isn't about necessarily about over application. This is about May 2001, no, May 2000, right? I, I put a crop of potatoes in the ground and they needed 155 pounds of nitrogen to get my normal average yield. Well, we had a significant drought and I only got half of my normal yield. So I had 65 to 75 pounds of nitrogen sitting out residual just because the crop didn't grow. So it's not 
always about over application. Do we need to refine rates? Yes. But there are moments, time, points in time where it's out of our control. Cover crops help, help us with insurance, essentially, to draw that nitrogen up and hold it nice and safe in an organic form in that plant material so that it can be used the next year. Further to that, you know, uh, precision fertilizer application, we are really not doing a good enough job utilizing the technology that we have to assess crop productivity across the landscape. You know, if you guys are, you know, if you're active primary producers, you know that there's good spots in the field and there's poor spots in the field. And too often we're fertilizing them all the same. We need to get down to it, really understand where we can push productivity and where we need to back off on productivity. Maybe those, maybe those poor production areas need to be rewilded. I'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, I'm not gonna get away with, fertilize, with the fertilizer talk again without talking about soil pH. And I labored that earlier, and I'll do it again. Soil pH correction, absolutely critical in the fight against climate change. Same thing goes for manure nitrogen. A little bit different because we're typically, we would be running you know, uh, forages in rotation. So we're gonna have those alfalfas or clovers to help us make nitrogen, but the principles are still the same. We've got to budget our manure nitrogen um, the same way we do our fertilizer nitrogen and make sure we're maximizing productivity. Okay, very close. Number nine, number 10. One thing we've identified is we've got these carbon rich landscape features that dot our ag production systems in the maritimes. And these are, you know, riparian zones along rivers and streams, perennial forages and pasture lands. Thinking about that, uh, Shignecto Isthmus, and that was those huge expanses of grass that exist down there, this huge carbon store that's there, right? We need to protect those, augment them where we can, but make sure that they're protected and used effectively. Wetlands, shelter belts, you name it. So we need to be thinking about those as a CO2 capturing. In some cases, we can, again, augment them, can improve them, we can expand them, store more carbon. But I think more fundamentally to, to where we're at right now in terms of adaptation and mitigation is to make sure that we preserve them. We don't wanna, we don't wanna, be, we don't wanna be changing the function of those carbon-rich landscape features. We need to keep them. And the last one I'll have here is that precision landscape management again, really understanding where we should be farming on the landscape. Right? We get too close to the wetland, we just don't get yield. And it starts to create all kinds of interactions between carbon and nitrogen. Bad things are happening there, right? So we need to know our, know our role, right? And utilize the landscape to its very best potential and really minimize our negative impacts. And I think using some precision agriculture, some yield monitoring technology, you know, some, some visual assertions. We can do that. Uh, and I think as we talk about, as, as we start to see greenhouse gas penalties being leveraged, right? Where we're maybe not just doing the right thing, it's gonna make us step back and, and take, a, take a different focus on, on what it is we're doing. Gary, I see your question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead off with that. I'm just gonna finish off with this slide as, as a return back to that, that triple bottom line. Right, people plan it, people plan it and profit. You guys have seen this lots. And, and I think this is, this is really where leadership uh, comes into focus for me on, on driving sustainability. It's not just farmers. It's not just retailers. It's not just the consumers in the villages done, but... that, that have a responsibility here. Because if we keep looking at across the fence for somebody to figure this out, we're never going to figure it out. But if we all come to the center, right, make it bearable, equitable, and viable, you know, we'll find sustainability in the, in, in, in the center of that. But it does take a concerted effort to partner. Okay. I've got a little bit here on the On-Farm Climate Action Fund, Kirsty, but, you know, I've been at it for 40 minutes. You know, maybe uh, maybe a chance for, for, I might just take Gary's question here and see if there's others 
Um, if, if there's not, then, then maybe I can go in and I've just got a few more slides about things that, that we can expect to see in terms of funding coming down. Yeah, go for it, however you like to proceed. Perfect, all right. So Gary asks us, what role do you see data playing the adoption and understanding of sustainable agriculture? Great question, Gary. I think it's fundamental. You know, in the last few slides really, really led to that, right? Understanding, understanding our, our impact acre by acre, meter by meter, is, is how we're going to get there. And that's where, you know, farm your best acre is, is the model that kind of that, that I had kind of put together in my mind and, and I threw that name on it. But if you take a look at some of the, there's some really advanced guys out West and they're doing broad acre farming, right? They're, you know, they're no tillers, but they're covering six, seven, 8,000 acres in a block. And Terry Aberhard um, is one guy that comes to mind. You know, he started taking a look at, at his crop yields as he rolled across uh, the landscape and the combine and just seeing, seeing that up and down and back and forth. And he asked the same question as Gary did. How do I use the data? Because he's got a yield monitor on the combine. All the new modern combines have them. They've got, they're already collecting data. How do we turn that into management? And so what, what we've typically done in the past is looked at yield, right? Well, this area is 35 bushels, not areas 60 bushels so that's good and bad but we never necessarily came back to understand what was the underlying limiting factor to go from 35 to 65. what terry did is he started looking at not yield per acre but profit per acre profit per acre and i love the story i read it in uh grain news or western producer he had a 300 acre block and he looked at it it was, it was bigger than that, it might've been 400 acres, but at a 400 acre block, and he looked at it on an acre by acre basis based on yield with blanket applications of all inputs. And he found that 80 acres of that 400 was consistently negative profitability by like 17 or 20 bucks, right? So $1,600 a year, this area of this field was losing him. So he went to the landowner and said, look, I'm not making money there. It's saline or whatever it was. He said, let me put it down to grass and let it express what it needs to express because that's what the prairies would have put there traditionally. Well, then the, the beef guy from up the road came along and said, hey, I see you got a new 80 acre block of hay there. Is Terry using that? They said, look, we don't know. We don't have some. Do you want to rent it? So everybody got to farm their best acre. Terry got to farm the good productive ground that would respond to fertilizer nitrogen and really push crop productivity. And the beef farmer down the road got access to 80 acres of obviously, you know, fairly good, fairly good uh, forage land. So who won? The landowner won, the beef farmer won, Terry won, the climate won both from a carbon and nitrogen perspective. So if we all agree to use the landscape to its very best, not just potential, but its best use, I think that's how we can let data really help us to, to tackle this. Who should pay for it? Well, Gary, I think there's a bundle there. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, through some of these strategic crop rotation options that, that I'll go with. I don't see any hands raised or other questions. So let me take you through it. I'll show you exactly who's gonna pay for it. Out of the $200 million that Minister Bebo announced, 20, $21 million are notionally uh, set aside for the Maritimes. Again, cover crops, nitrogen management, and pasture management. So we're gonna pay for cover crops, likely gonna be paying you know, 50% of the total seed cost to get this job done, right? So opportunity for fall rye into potatoes, uh, tie in rye grass underneath uh, your corn silage or grain corn, uh, rye grass under, you know, spring barley wheat, 
uh, or oats or you know red clover into into a winter wheat crop or into a fall rye crop if you're a potato operator and you're looking to get that fall rye in rotation for the allelopathic effects and all the good things that fall rye does for us. So there's one way that the federal government's going to pay for that. Always keeping something growing. There's your cover crops and that fertility management. Again, we're looking at good nitrogen management planning here, deploying the four hour nutrient management systems, but also investing in precision agriculture. Right, so that we're using point row shutoffs for our fertilizer spreaders, so we're not getting double application, you know, when we come into the corners of the field. Again, using that technology to its very best extent and allowing it to control the machines that are behind us. Because if you are an operator, you know that sometimes it is quite tricky um, to be turning at the end of the field and watching the GPS, making sure the spinner's off, the gate is closed, and turn it back around and getting it lined up. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. So using technology to help us drive our fertility management is, a, is another way the federal government is going to help us pay for it. Oh man, where's my slide on pasture management? Third one is, is pasture management. We're going to see some investment in, in rotational grazing and water systems infrastructure that's going to help us to, to run our pastures more effectively. Um, so that's, um, those, are, those are three ways that the feds are going to invest. Uh, further to that, you know, the conservation agencies, we hear it all the time. Um, they're, they typically have dollars that they'd like to spend on the landscape, but they struggle to find growers to participate with, right? And to me, that, that's a shame. There's money that the conservation industry wants to invest in conservation or sustainable ag, and they can't find growers to work with them, right? So there's an, op there's an option there. There's an open door. Provincial governments, um, keep an eye on those uh, Canadian Agriculture Partnership dollars. Lots of lots of funding for BMPs. Lots of funding for BMPs that are coming out of those those FedProv uh, uh, programs. Um, quite honestly, it's it's not typically a, a access to dollars that's the limitation in driving this. It's actual limitations in the number of people that are willing to participate or understand the program. And the last one I will say, I will say, um, the value chain stakeholders need to play a role as well. So I mentioned the Danones, the McCain's, the PepsiCo's, um, Nutrien, groups like that, Yara, Canada. They have all developed what they call insetting programs where they are going to be paying for growers to adopt BMPs that sequester nitrogen and carbon. And the value of that is what they need to take to Paris in 2030. So I think we're gonna see an, a, a major shift in the way those stakeholders engage directly with the growers of the primary products that make their products. I think we're gonna see that value chain start to make, make those investments because they need to see the chain. Does that answer your question, Gary? Or stimulate some more, more thoughts anyway. I have a question if no one else does. Um, and yeah, if anyone else has any, please put them in the chat here. But I know you presented to the standing committee for the New Brunswick climate change update. And I was wondering if you could maybe give us you know, areas to focus on. It is open for public consultation. So if anyone here listening is planning on putting in some recommendations, what do you think are, you know, the biggest opportunities or the best ways that um, the general public can recommend for this update? Oh, right on the spot. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I think to me, there's, there's three things. Um, first off is leadership. I think we've, we've spent too much time pointing the finger at who should be doing this work forestry, 
the oil refinery in St. John, transport industry, whoever, right? Lots, lots of figures to point. You know, the, who are carrying the buck for this, MB Power. One of the things I think we've missed at the Department of Agriculture is we don't have strong leadership there. There's nobody really driving this ship for New Brunswick Agriculture to, to, to be part of the various, you know, national or, or international frameworks or stories or initiatives that are really shaping what's going to be happening on the ground. And I told this to the standing committee, we're gonna have agriculture play a role, then there needs to be some leadership at the Department of Agriculture. And I think, you know, that goes all the way up to the premier's office. We've played political football with this thing for way too long. And now it's the farmers and ranchers that are at the front lines of, of dealing with that. So leadership is number one. The second thing I would say is, you know, having a good feed-in tariff rate structure that supports distributed renewable energy. And again, I said this to the standing committee, like now when, when I was doing biogas assessments 10 years ago, you know, it was pretty consistent. If we had a feed-in tariff rate of right around 17 cents, we could make it work. There was enough left over that you could, you could probably make a few bucks. And if you had off-farm sources and materials that, that I mentioned earlier to close that nutrient loop, it got even better, right? So now we're 10 years hence. Carbon is no longer, I think I was using $15 a ton, it's now 40. And by 2030, it's gonna be a buck 70. So I said, build a feed-in tariff that just, even if it just takes into account the appreciating cost price of carbon, right? If that's one cent, two cent a year, right? Up and up and up. All of a sudden now our solar panels are looking pretty good. Our solar hot water systems are looking good. Our biogas systems are looking good. Community-based wind projects are looking pretty good. You know, I'll say straight up, I'm not a big fan of the small distributed wind systems on farm because those smaller turbines didn't tend to hold together as well as the larger commercial ones. But again, I want to take a page out of Germany. They incentivized communities to invest in one big commercial turbine. They all owned a piece of it, as opposed to everybody having their own little turbines that had to be managed. So feed-in tariff would be the second one. The third one, we gotta close this nutrient loop. We gotta close the nutrient loop. We gotta stop. If you think about you know, every truckload of bread that comes in out of Quebec, to the Maritimes has an inherent nutrient value. And we eat that bread and then it goes away from our houses and it goes to energy intensive processing systems that get rid of those nutrients. And then we go to Morocco and we mine phosphorus and we bring it back in on ships that's getting more and more expensive. We need to close our nutrient loops. We we're not allowed to put our manure from our dairy and dairy farms into the river. We have to reuse it. And that's a good thing. That's the way nature intended it to be. <clears throat> At the same token, the largest herd of livestock in New Brunswick stands on two legs. And we, because we're higher on the food chain, we can flush our manure down the river and it's A-OK. -okay. Well, it's a-okay as until we can't get the fertilizer nutrients and we're wondering where our food comes from. So I think we need to take a really hard look at recycling, at using biogas, using compost, but using MSW products to feed ourselves. And I think we, we ignore that at our peril. Great, that was a great answer, thank you. Um, well, if anyone else doesn't have any questions, questions. It is five o'clock and I don't want to keep anyone over. So you had your email on the screen there in case anyone wanted to get in touch with you. There we go. Oh, come on. I went all the way by. <laughs> well, thank you, Cedric, so much. That was very, very interesting. So much information to take home. And I really hope that everyone learned something and 
we can go and make some great recommendations to the the um the standing committee here so thank you so much for your time i did put the the link to the evaluation form if and if everyone can fill that out that would be great and thank you again cedric this was great thanks for the opportunity it's been a pleasure anytime you got my digits give me a buzz perfect thank you right. have a good night everyone <laughs>